Hello and welcome to this session. This is Professor Farhat in which we'll keep working with SOC engagement. As we mentioned earlier, SOC engagement is an attestation engagement where a professional auditor CPA will pass a judgment on something. And on that something, as far as SOC engagement, passing a judgment on the management description of their systems, whether these controls are designed appropriately, and in case of a type two, type two report, whether these controls are effectively operating. In this session, specifically, we're going to take a look at how the auditor assesses whether management depiction of the service organization align with the description criteria. Simply put, we're going to look at what is the auditor's responsibility or role when it comes to management description. Let's go ahead and get started. Before we proceed any further, I have a public announcement about my company, FarhatLectures.com. Farhat Accounting Lectures is a supplemental educational tool that's going to help you with your CPA exam preparation as well as your accounting courses. My CPA material is aligned with your CPA review course such as Becker, Roger, Wiley, Gleam, Miles. My accounting courses are aligned with your accounting courses broken down by chapter and topics. My resources consist of lectures, multiple choice questions, true-false questions, as well as exercises. Go ahead, start your free trial today. So what are the auditor's responsibility for management description under SOC 1? Well, SOC 1 report focuses on the controls at a service organization that impact the financial reporting of the user's entity. Remember, we have the user entity and we have the service organization. So we have the service org that provides services for the user entity. And I always say user entity is Farhat Lectures and the service organization could be a payroll company. So what we're concerned with is what is the impact of the service organization services on the user's entity financial reporting? So here we need to know what are the auditor's responsibility when evaluating the management description because the service organization will provide will provide description of what they do. They provide the description to the user's entity. So we, the auditor is going to look at those description and determine if those description are appropriate, free of material errors, so on and so forth. So what are what are the auditor's responsibilities? Well, one thing is the fair presentation of the system description. So how do, how would the auditor determine whether the system is fairly presented? Where do they start? Well, very easy. Start by reading and assessing whether the management description of the service organization is fair and accurate. That's where we start. What does that mean? It means read it check everything. This involves checking that all the information within the scope. Remember, each engagement will have its scope. So if something in the description is outside the scope, it's not our concern of the engagement is presented fairly in all material respect. So we start from there. Also, auditor will have to evaluate whether the controls objective, objective stated in the management description are reasonable given the circumstances. So for example, for the payroll company, they would say something like uh, to the effect of our deduction and withholding are properly computed. Now we need to, and they will give you controls on how they make sure the proper, the deductions are properly computed from the, from the paycheck. Well, we're going to evaluate whether the controls objective stated are reasonable given the circumstances. This means ensuring that the objectives are suitable for the services provided and align with the needs of the user's entity that rely on these controls because the user entity wants to make sure that their employees are getting paid from the service organization system and they are computing the net amount for those employees properly. In other words, withholding the taxes for the employee properly. Other responsibilities will be implementation of control. The auditor checks that the controls mentioned in the management description are not only appropriately designed, but also properly implemented. Okay, they are designed, but are they also implemented? That's part of the responsibility. And this is crucial because it confirms that the controls are actively functioning and effective in managing risk related to financial reporting. They could be on paper, but we want to make sure they are implemented. Also, if there is any complementary control description, what are complementary control description? We talked about those. If we have QC, which is the complementary user entity controls, 
These are controls that the user entity must implement. So remember, Farhat Lectures is the user entity, is the user entity, and the payroll company, and the payroll company is the service organization. Now the service company would say our controls only work if you gave us the proper name, social security, um, marital status of the employees in order to compute their income taxes properly. So the Farhat lectures, the user entity will have will, ha will have to have certain controls. So those are called complementary user entity control. The auditor must ensure that they are adequately described so user entities are aware of their responsibilities. So the payroll service, they have to spell that out in their description that look, for our control to work properly, the user entity for hat lectures will have to do what? Implement certain controls. And sometime the payroll company, the payroll service organization might use a vendor. For example, they might handle their HR services or cloud services. The vendor could be considered a subservice entity. And under the subservice entity, we could have complementary subservice organization controls. If the service organization outsources cloud services to any any of its services to another entity, it's important that controls at this subservice organization are also described. So this includes details about the roles and the controls they implement that affect the service organization. So if there, there are any there, if there's any controls with the vendor at the vendor company that we need to be aware of in order for the payroll service company's control to work properly, we have to spell this out. Remember, we could have, we need the user entity to have their own controls and we need, we need to have the vendor, which is the vendor here, what, what we call them is the subservice organization to have certain controls for our controls to work properly. Our means the payroll a company or the service organization. In description of the subservice organization services, whether we're going to be using the carve out method. And again, all these topics, I'm going over them. This is like every time I mention the queues, the complementary user entity control and the CSOCs, the complementary subservice organization. This is all a review because we already had sessions about this. Same thing with the description of the subservice organization services, whether we are using the carve out method or the inclusive method. Just real quick, under the carve out method, the services and control of the subservice organization are excluded from the main service organization report. Inclusive method, the services and controls of the subservice organization are included in the service organization SOC reports. So they say the subservice and the service organization together, they have to work together for the control to be appropriate. Now we could take a look at some attribute of suitable criteria because we want to take a look at suitable criteria in the management description. How do we know whether the management description is proper? What are some suitable criteria? So the criteria for evaluating the fair presentation of management description and a SOC engagement are extensive and detailed, aimed at ensuring a comprehensive understanding of the service organization system. Again, we're going to have a list. It doesn't mean that's comprehensive or complete. It just gives you an idea what are some good attributes. Just kind of reinforce all this, you may not have to remember the attributes, but at least if they make sense, it means you understand them. System design and implementation. The description should clearly present how the service organization system was designed and implemented. Don't you think this is helpful? Of course, this includes detailing the procedures and control that are in place to ensure the services are performed effectively. The type of services and transaction they provide, the description should include the type of services provided by the organization specifying the classes of transaction processed, you know, payroll, uh, withholding, making payment to state, local and federal government. This gives an understanding on the breadth and scope of the operation. Procedures of service delivery. Both automated and manual system used in the service delivery should be described. If they have an automated system, describe them. If it's a manual system, describe them. This includes outlining the procedures through which services are provided. The use of information. The information utilized in performing these procedures should also be provided. This includes any accounting record, support and documentation, from initiation to authorization to recording to processing to end up reporting. Use of information details of that. Handling of significant event. How do we handle significant event? How the system captures and addresses significant event and condition apart from transaction processes that should be described. This would include handling of non-routine and exceptional, exceptional circumstances. That's normal in business. Every once in a while, you have an odd transaction 
How do we handle this? Reporting processes. This, the process used to prepare reports and other relevant output for users entity need to be clearly outlined. How do we do this? And this ensures that the user entity understand how the information they receive is produced. You want to know this. Okay, I'm, I'm, I'm looking at this report. I need to know how did they came up with this report. That should be in the description. Any involvement of of the subservice organization, which is the vendor that's considered a subservice. If there is any services provided by a service organization, they must be described, including the nature of the service and how they are integrated into the service organization offering. Control objectives and controls. The specific control objective and control design to achieve these objectives should be outlined. This includes a description of, of how these controls are supposed to work and their intended impact. And of course, the overall control environment, other relevant aspect of the service organization control environment should be described because here we're talking about SOC 1, internal control over financial reporting. So we have to be familiar with the internal control framework, which is, you know, the control activities, monitoring information system and communication, uh, risk assessment, those they have to be spelled out spelled out type two the difference between SOC 1 type 1 and SOC 1 type 2 is SOC 1 type 2 remember we're looking at a period of time and we're looking at the effectiveness of the control because in type 2 we look at the effect as, uh, at the effectiveness of the control over a period of time in the context of a SOC 1 type 2 report there are specific criteria concerning the management description of the, of the service organization system that are important for ensuring completeness and accuracy of the report. What are those? Inclusion of changes to the system. What does that mean? For type two report, which cover a specific period rather than a point in time as in type one, it's crucial that management description include any relevant changes made to the service organization during throughout the period cover not one period, one point in time. And this ensures that the users of the report understand how the system has evolved over time, potentially affecting the design of it and its effectiveness. So I want to know if there's any changes and when did the, those changes took place. I want to take make sure everything is accurate and complete in the description. The description provided by management should not omit or present misleading information about the service organization system. This criterion helps ensure that the information in the reports are reliable and the user's entity can rely on them in assessing the control environment at the service organization. Also, we have to balance between detail and broad applicability. While it's important for the description to be comprehensive, we cannot look at everything. It's also, it's also recognized that the description is prepared to meet the common needs of wide range of users, entities, and their auditors. We cannot have every single piece of information. Remember, the, user, the, the users of these reports are the user entity and their auditors. We could have few of them, 10, 15 different user entities. We could have one. We cannot cover everything for them. Therefore, the description may not dive into every specific detail that might be considered important, and in particular environment unique to individual users entity. Instead, we focus on providing information that's most relevant and useful for a broad audience. The role of the service auditor in a SAC 1 engagement involves several important consideration and assessment to make sure the reliability and completeness of the report. What are those? Well, assessing the adequacy of the description detail. Just looking at this, the auditor must evaluate the management description system, including does it have sufficient details? This means ensuring the description provide enough information to understand the design and operation of the controls, as well as their effectiveness over the reporting period. Also, the level of detail should be appropriate for the nature of the services provided and understandable to the user entity, of course. Understanding the nature of the user's entity. We have to understand the user's entity themselves because this is the targeted group. The other ne needs to understand who, user, who the user's entity are and the nature of the reliance of the service organization. Think about a financial statement audit. We want to know who's the targeted group in the financial statement. Is this a bank for a particular loan? Is it for an IPO? Those are the user entities here. Same concept. This, uh, this, underline, this understanding helps in assessing whether the service organization's control and related description adequately address the needs and concern specific to those users. Of course, we need to understand what their need is so we meet, we can match the description 
to their need. Are they are they really sending them, not sending them, providing the proper service to the user's entity need? For example, different type of service entities might require different information based on regulatory environment or business processes. Also, the auditor need to review available documentation from the service organization, such as policy and procedures, manual, legal contract, and process narratives. And these documents provide a deeper insight into the service organization control environment and are essential for verifying the accuracy and completeness of the management description because we can cross-reference those legal contract procedures, processes, uh, process narratives to actually what's in the description and they should match because it's, it's coming from the same company. Um, other roles of the auditor in SOC 1 engagement, conducting inquiries and other procedures be beyond document review, the auditor engages in inquiries and other procedures to confirm the service organization has indeed been imp implemented as described. And this involved interacting with people, observing operation, and possibly testing control to validate they are functioning as intended throughout the specific period. Determining implementation of the system, the auditor here must verify that the controls described were not only designed appropriately, but also in operation during the period covered by a SOC report. And this is crucial because a design that's not implemented has give you no assurance. Okay, I have it on paper, but is it being implemented? What the user entity is concerned about, not if you have something good on paper, I want to make sure it's working properly because I am influenced. So these steps collectively make sure that the service auditor can provide a reliable and trustworthy report confirming that the service organization control are suitably designed and operational, therefore supporting the user's entity need for assurance regarding their financial dependency on the service organization. So when do we conclude that the description in a SOC report is not considered fairly stated or fairly presented? Two conditions. One is misrepresentation of the control performance. As it states, if the description states or implies that certain controls are being performed when in fact they are not, the description is misleading. Well, this can lead to a false sense of security among user entities who may believe that certain risks are being managed when they are not. That's crucial for the integrity of the SOC report that all described control are actively and effectively in operation under the coverage period. Also, emission of relevant controls. The description can also be, be misleading if it's emit relevant control that are performed by the service organization, especially if these emitted are not suitably designed or operating effectively. That's another reason. Emitting such information can skew the understanding of the service organization control environment, leaving out critical data about potential weaknesses and gaps in the system. Simply put, for a SOC report description to be considered fairly stated, it must accurately reflect the actual control environment at the service organization. Oh, I hope this makes sense. The description has to reflect what's actually happening. Not more, not less. It should be neither claim underperformed control as active, nor emit important details about the control that are crucial for understanding the system effectiveness and design. So such transparency ensures that the user entities, people that use this report, have a realistic and comprehensive view of service organization controls, helping them making proper decision in relying on the services provided. Let's take a look at this multiple choice question from farhatlectures.com. Which of the following would be considered a suitable source of evidence for an auditor reviewing a service organization control environment? Okay? Industry news article about the service organization. Well, that's going to give us information about the company, but that's industry news. Who, you know, who wrote the article? How much do they know? Is it an opinion? How factual it is? We really don't know much about the organization control environment. I would say that's not a strong one. B, policies and procedures, manuals provided by the organization. Uh, well, that's for one thing, it's from inside the company. That's good news, right? I would say between A and B, I will keep B for now because policies and proc policy manual are provided from within the company and that's, that's evidence about their control environment, direct evidence from the company. And this is what I'm looking for. I'm looking for information about the company itself. How about informal conversation with former employees? Well, 
for one thing, they're former employees. They don't know what's going on in the company now. Even with current employees, uh, between policies and procedures and um, and the current employees, I'm not really sure what I would choose uh, because employees could lie, right? And policies and procedures may not be implemented. So it, it's, it's a tough one. But since we made this a uh, former employees, be careful here, okay? Be careful uh, because we're talking about former employees. This would eliminate the, the answer choice. Uh, but between C and B, then former, if they're current employees, what's their position? What's their knowledge? Uh, so it, it will be a tough one. But I would say between B and C currently take out C because they're formal. D, competitors internal control report. I should not look at competitors internal control report to learn about the, orga the service organization control environment because it has nothing to do. One has nothing to do with the other. I need to maybe review it to understand the business uh, better, but that's not going to give me any information. So policy and procedures manual provided by the organization should give you suitable evidence for an for their control environment. I would say B is the answer. What should you do now? You want to go to Farhat Lectures, look at additional MCQs. That's going to help you, especially if you're studying for your information systems and controls exam. Invest in yourself. Good luck. Study hard. And of course, stay safe.